The Man Who Killed Don Quixote opens with a title card informing the audience that it's a film 25 years in the making, which is both sort of true and also sort of a self-aggrandizing work of mythic exaggeration, which of course perfectly befits the subject on any number of levels save for the actual fact of the film itself. A low-key, deliberately paced, modest affair best viewed as either an off-tempo jazz riff on Cervantes' actual Don Quixote story, and an afterthought anecdote to the career of the director who's been exploring these same basic themes across his career in most of his better-known films or both. But being push-marketed as an event by virtue of the fact that at this point the reason to go see it is all about knowing how bizarre it is that it exists at all. Namely, direct Terry Gilliam, the auteur animator late of Monty Python and karmically cursed Helmer of films you didn't know existed in theaters, but realized were classics later on like Time Bandits Brazil, The Adventures of Aaron Munchausen, The Fisher King, Twelve Monkeys in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and also Zero Theorem, Jabberwocky, The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, The Brothers Grimm, and Tideland, which also exists, has been trying to make a film called The Man Who Killed Don Quixote ever since the late 1990s, starting out as a time travel comedy starring Johnny Depp and the late Jean Rochefort that was ultimately destroyed by so much freakish bad luck that the disastrous unmaking of the film was itself turned into the cult classic documentary Lost in La Mancha in 2002. Too. Having restarted the project several times with multiple other actors over the years, Gilliam finally completed a new, substantially retooled version of the concept, now featuring Adam Driver and Jonathan Price, which was subsequently held up for a few more years by business problems, lawsuits, studio changes, and the director himself having said stupid shit in the press, and thus losing a bunch of his guy everyone always roots for points. In any case, with wider home distribution still to be decided, it's now made its way to theaters by way of a series of one-night event screenings courtesy Fathom Events. Your one-stop destination for Dragon Ball Z premieres, movies you can't believe are old enough or well-remembered enough to get an anniversary release, creepy megachurch streams, and for some reason now also this. Mostly pretty interesting, if not particularly groundbreaking thing that's more impressive for existing at all than for what it exists as. In any case, as this is a Terry Gilliam movie, our subject is the breakdown between reality and fantasy as viewed through the eyes of a creatively stunted but wistful protagonist, torn between responsibility and true heart's desire, struggling to avoid learning the eventual hard lesson that only the surrender to siren call of madness can free one from the crushing mundanity of a fallen world, as symbolized by repeated failures to rescue an ingenue from corruption, realized through kitchen sink surrealist fantasy imagery, and undercut by glancing blows of self-effacing humor humor that acknowledge an awareness of the more problematic points of permanently immature rebel artist hero type, but fall short of subverting them in the ways that have gotten progressively less adorable as the world has evolved and Gilliam's sensibilities have, for the most part, not. Technically speaking, it's the story of Adam Driver as a successful but creatively burned out commercial director who, while shooting an expensive ad for an obnoxious boss somewhere in rural Spain, discovers a bootleg DVD of his own student film, an arty black and white reimagining of Don Quixote, coincidentally shot in a nearby village using locals as actors, being sold by a mysterious beggar, and is compelled to pay the site a visit for nostalgia's sake. There, he discovers that his long ago visit has left negative effects on the town. The young girl he cast as Dulcinea, entranced at the suggestion that she could become an actress, has instead become a high-priced escort, and now property of a sinister Russian oligarch currently making trouble in the region, while the elderly man who'd played Quixote, played by Jonathan Price, has become convinced that he actually is the character and is now imprisoned as a mentally unstable sideshow attraction. Through a series of accidents and misunderstandings, Driver and Price, who believes the director is his squire Sancho Panza, wind up wandering the countryside on the run from police and other dangers, drifting in and out of what may or may not be shared delusions that eventually transform into a quest to rescue the aforementioned actress from the Russian villain and a final confrontation with the reality and or unreality of both men's lives that mirrors the central question of whether the realness of one's beliefs matters weighed against what we're spurred to do by them that exist at the heart of Don Quixote itself and indeed the obsession that story can't help but conjure in the heart of other storytellers, Gilliam after all not being the first director to go nearly mad trying to make a Don Quixote movie. Taken on its own, it's a perfectly serviceable riff on the concept, with Price's committed comic performance being the main highlight and Driver continuing to impress with how much sheer dramatic and physical range he possesses, able to snap back and forth between grim moody resolve and flailing old-time comedy slapstick from scene to scene while still feeling like the same character, and while Gilliam ever-present shortcomings as an observer of humanity are only more prominent in a more intimate lower-budget film setting. He still has difficulty realizing women as characters beyond the Madonna horror complex and the complex itself beyond a thing that's there rather than being worth examining. It's a welcome surprise that he gets more mileage than you'd expect from tweaking the classism and latent paternalism innate to Quixote's romanticism of the so-called age of chivalry amidst all the usual romance for dreamers and people who get lost in the imaginary world. Still, apart from the generally more apocalyptic tone his work overall has taken on since Tideland and Zero Theorem, one imagines it would be hard for even those only passingly familiar with the other films to not come away feeling like Gilliam is restated in bite-sized, more literal form, a set of ideas and observation about Quixote, characters like him, his own relationship to both that have been explored in his own work, and much of the work he's inspired in others very thoroughly well before now, particularly Munchausen and Fisher King, both of which feel like much more richly textured versions of what he's shooting for here. It's certainly not a bad film, it's well-paced, it keeps your attention, well-performed, and taken as a companion to both Lost in La Mancha and the general mythology surrounding the making and unmaking of the thing, a fascinating relic of pop cinema history in its own right. There's a certain justice in the idea of it not only finally existing, but being some kind of absolute masterpiece, and it's certainly not that, but for now, 6 under 10, certainly enough under the circumstances. Yeah.